Today, I'm speaking with Emma Trellis on a fine Indiana morning, uh, April 16, 2012. Um, this is part of the oral history program at uh, Notre Dame University, the uh, Letras Latina. Uh, my name is Sylvia Corbello. I was the judge of the 2010 Andres Montoya Poetry Prize, and I had the great honor of selecting Emma's very fine first book, Tropicalia as the winner who published by the University of Notre Dame Press. Welcome, Emma. It's great to see you. It's great to see you, too. Once more. <laughs> Once more. <laughs> I guess I will just start at the beginning. Tell me a little bit. You were, you were born in Miami. You've mm -hmm. lived there all your life, pretty much? In South Florida, yes. South Florida. Uh, I lived, I've lived in Miami. Miami Beach, Hollywood, and Hollandale. But in Hollywood and Hollandale are just the county over. Uh, greater Miami, as you were telling me earlier, it's all Miami, it's all Miami. <laughs> once you get uh, to Palm Beach, right? Both your parents are from Cuba. Yes, they're both from Cuba, from La Havana, although my mother's family is also from, and I'm totally blanking out on the province now, mm -hmm. uh, it's not Santo Espiritu, that's where my stepdad's family is from, they do a big reunion mm -hmm. oh. uh, in Miami every oh. year of all the Santo Espirituanos. You know what? It's in a poem. Oh, I have, oh that's close, close to me. Yes, yeah, close to Matanza. So the, your parents emigrated when they were young? Yeah, they were about 19 and 20. So they've actually been in this country for much longer. They're in their 60s now. Mm -hmm. They've been in this country much longer than they were in Cuba. And they're very patriotic. And they married in Cuba? or they? No, they, no. They, my, yeah. my mother came over with her family first. And then a year later, my father left his entire family and came over alone to, uh, to marry her. Have they been back to Cuba, or have you been back? No, neither one of them has been back to Cuba. I've asked my mother about. She said she has no interest in returning. That this, uh, she doesn't want to see the changes mm, and the yeah. deterioration. And they both feel like this is their country. Mm. Although they're very Cuban in a lot of ways, but they're also fluent in English. When my mother reads, she reads in English. Mm. I think. I think. Of course, there's always a connection there and they do speak of it more and more as they get older mm -hmm. but they're very they very much consider themselves american mm -hmm. always thought that that there is no one as patriotic as an immigrant mm -hmm. that's become a citizen true. that's very true and they're very much a mm -hmm. part of that mold so you did you grow up speaking both english and spanish my first language was spanish and i, I clearly remember starting kindergarten not understanding what anyone was saying Hmm. but very excited about learning this mysterious tongue. And then I just, I guess I just picked it up fairly quickly in school and, and believe it or not, also watching Sesame Street. <laughs> have you ever attempted to write in Spanish? No, I, I feel like I don't have the kind of vocabulary at hand mm -hmm. that I have in English and Spanish, although that's not necessarily a drawback, but I just feel like I, my linguistic skills are much more proficient mm. in English. Although I do speak Spanish, and I, and I do have Spanish in some of my poems. That makes sense, because I've written some in Spanish, but I've, because I've done 80% or more of my reading in English, I just feel like I'm much more fluid, and, and it feels like I'm trying when I'm writing in Spanish. Mm. You're not listening to the poem. You're forcing something. Mm -hmm. but One thing that I'm actually interested in, and I think this is my way of using a little more into the Spanish language, is I've talked a little bit with poet uh, Dan Vera mm. in D.C. about just translating one by mm. Jose Martí. Oh. Just one. Yeah. And I just want to see what that experience is like and if that'll just acclimate me a little more with the language. But... <laughs> The thing that I really need to do is I need to read more in Spanish. Mm -hmm. and I don't read in Spanish at all, so it mm -hmm. just takes me a long time to do that. But that's well, how we It's much learn. easier now because there's so much more access to, to books yes, through Amazon. Definitely. When I was in my 20s and 30s, and I'd have to come. Of course, you live in Miami, so mm -hmm. you have plenty of books. So you don't have any excuse. So you mentioned that your mother is your biggest fan. Yes. And she true. clips all the articles about you. Yeah. Now, is she uh, a reader of poetry? Did you grow up with poetry in your home? We didn't, but she's a big reader. Mm. And books were very much a part of our lives, uh, all four of our lives, uh, my brother and my father and my mm -hmm. mother. Particularly when we were growing up, 
My parents always took us to bookstores. Back then, it was just uh, B. Dalton mm -hmm. and Walden Books, I think it was called. So that was pretty much one of our regular outings. We were very we were working middle class, so our outings would consist of going to the bookstore <laughs> or going to the library. Huh. My mother took us to the library every week. And then she would also sign us up for book clubs where we would look in this little menu of choices and select mm -hmm. the paperbacks that we wanted. And, and then she would order them from us. So from a very early age, they were big presence in my life, reading and, and, and books. So at what age did you transition from being a reader to thinking you were going to become a writer? I started writing poems when I was in elementary school. Oh. I used to go, I used to bus some of us to this arts program twice a week. And I had a wonderful language arts teacher mm. named Mrs. McGoy. She was like a hippie. She had like long hair and John Lennon spectacles. And she would play Wabash Cannonball on her guitar. <laughs> I loved her. Mm. And, and she would have us write different kinds of poems, free verse, haiku, some of it inspired by pictures that we cut out from magazines. And so I kept on writing poems. And, and then in elementary school, we had a project that we had to write a book and actually physically sew together a book ourselves. And I wrote a book of poems uh, for my project. And I called it From Me to You. And, and I covered it with some coffee mocha colored fabric that my mother had around the house and pasted little <laughs> letters on it. And so I did. And then I probably wrote an occasional horrible adolescent poem but I didn't really start writing poems in a more con concentrated way until I was in my 20s mm -hmm. when I started taking undergraduate workshops after already having received my bachelor's mm -hmm. in finance and international business really yes oh, wow. which I despised <laughs> and uh, it took me about six years to get that bachelor's because I kept on skipping class so having to take the class over because of some poor grade. But I started realizing that I didn't want to work in business. And the reason that I was so unhappy studying that is because it, it was just not the way my brain worked. Yeah. A series of events led me to take an introduction to creative writing mm. workshop at Florida International University. I started writing poems and prose. And eventually I got my second bachelor's in English because that completely seeped. Mm. Every, I took so many creative writing classes, I realized, oh, I just need a few more classes and I'll have right. this bachelor's. Yeah. So I did and you know, I loved it. I'd look at the syllabus mm. and it'd be 20 books that I wanted to read anyway. Mm. So I did that and I entered uh, the MFA program as a, mm. as a fiction writer. But soon enough, Poetry just swept me up. There's two things that really interest me about your background. First, you were a working journalist mm -hmm. for a while. How long did you do that and what did you leave it? And would you go back to it again? I, I finished my MFA and, of course, there are no jobs for professional poets. <laughs> no? Uh, no. <laughs> but in my last semester in graduate school, I, I stumbled into a travel writing gig for a book. It was a series of books called Edge Guides, and they focused New York, Austin, maybe mm. San Francisco, and one of them was in Miami. And someone recommended me. I had never done anything like that before. But they contacted me and another journalist, mm. who was a real journalist at the time, and he wound up dropping out of the project, and I wound up writing the entire book myself. And now I had some clips. So I finished my master's, and I started applying to writing jobs. Some of them were corporate writing jobs. Mm. Some of them were online sites. And one of them was a paid fellowship at New Times, which mm. is now owned by the Village Voice Media. Huh. And I sent them my clips and they really liked them. And they called me in to interview me. And I, I just told them, listen, I didn't go to journalism school. I have no mm -hmm. experience whatsoever, but I can write. And they were like, yeah, clearly you can, and we think we can teach you the rest of it. So they mm -hmm. hired me. And then after the paid fellowship was over, they hired me as a staff writer. And how long did you do that? I was there for about a year and a half, but it was mostly hard news, which I did not want to do. It's just, it can be very dispiriting. I, I, I got a really wonderful education there about how the world 
really works. Mm -hmm. uh, not that justice is not always served and those that are in the right are often neglected mm -hmm. or abused. And it's important work, but it's not what I wanted the focus of my life to be on. So I applied for another staff writer job at an arts and entertainment weekly called mm. Street, run by the Miami Herald. And I was there for about three years. Mm. And I went off on my own as a freelancer. And after a while, I was hired as the art critic at the Sun Sentinel, a Tribune mm. paper. Mm -hmm. And I was there for three years. That was a full-time staff writer position. So in total, in between freelancing and newspaper staff jobs, wow, four years ago, what does sound? Maybe 10 years? Well, a decade. Yeah. And why did you finally do that? The a Sentinel was bought by this sort of evil corporate pirate named Sam Zell, mm. and he just started disassembling uh, all of the Tribune papers. And I, almost from the moment I was hired, people were getting laid off. And it was like the third or fourth round of layoffs, and I was offered a buyout, which is essentially mm. you agree to leave in exchange for oh. yeah a certain package. Mm. And and I just realized it's I'm not getting any younger. And journalism is a completely consuming job. Mm -hmm. I really had yeah. very little time to put together a book. I was eking out poems a little bit at a time, mm -hmm. but I just didn't have the mental or even physical energy just to sit down and give that my all. And I figured this was the right time to do it. So mm -hmm. I leapt off the cliff, and so far it's mm -hmm. and here you are. Out. Yes, <laughs> here I am. Here I am. <laughs> there, there's so much attention to detail in your work and almost like a documentary feel to many of your pieces. Yeah. Do you feel like you bring a journalist's eye to your work? I think that's just my eye. Mm. And I think I brought it to my journalism. Because you already had it. Because, But I developed it there, certainly. Mm. And I love that you say that, that documentary feel, because I do think of the poem as a document mm. in various mm -hmm. ways. And I've often thought of it that way. That's nice that it comes yeah. across. Well, it certainly does. Do, did you ever feel that there's a conflict, or maybe you don't see yourself as a journalist, it's just something that you fell into, but there is the journalist's version of the truth, which is just the facts, ma'am, and then there's the poet's version of the truth, which is the spirit of the truth, and you take huge liberties to arrive at that. Do you find that there's a conflict between those two things? It's interesting because even journalism, yes, it's just the facts, but the facts that you select, there's a subjectivity involved there that kind of shapes the story mm -hmm. in one way or the other. Um, and then certainly with poetry, it's just much more liberating not to have to constantly triple check everything and make sure everything is spelled correct right. and accurate. Yeah. Although I do that anyway because I've been <laughs> trained to do that. It's liberating in some ways, but it's also uh, daunting because now, you know, Everything is invented. Everything is coming from your, mm, the landscape right. of my own mind. Mm -hmm. So there's good parts about it and more challenging parts about that idea. You mentioned that you were an, an um, art critic, which mm. is something that uh, a number of poets have made quite a career out of, like John Ashbery, who we were talking about last night, John Yao. And uh, yourself. <laughs> <laughs> in a small, in a, in a lesser sense, uh, mm -hmm. Ricardo Paviosa is, mm -hmm. is as well known yes. an art critic as he is a poet. Yes. Why visual art? Why not literature or, or music? I, I did for many years write about local bands oh, and music okay. and uh, acts coming into town. And, and I have written a lot of book reviews. I, honestly, I was very surprised to be hired as the art critic because I only had a few stories that were centered around visual art. But I think they were looking for somebody that was flexible. Mm -hmm. I could write a lot of different kinds of arts stories. And I just don't think the editors really knew a lot about visual art. So I came across as I did. And uh, <laughs> I learned on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's the best way. You know? yeah. Let's talk about Tropicalia. Okay. It's, you know, it's a wonderful book. It was, I, I was telling you before, it was one of the first manuscripts I read, and it became the one that all the manuscripts kind of I compared to. And in the end, of course, I selected it as the winner. The book is named after the Brazilian art movement of the 60s and 70s. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How that? I was 
was introduced to that by a very good friend named Steve Cho. He's a musician. He's probably better known around town as Mr. Entertainment. He's a real character. (laughs) And he's just taught me a lot about music. And one time I was in his house, which was full of all this folk art and collectibles and Mm -hmm. books and music. Just incredible. Him and his wife are just uh, avid collectors of the unusual. He had a CD that he lent me by Caetano Veloso called Sunday. And it was just this dreamy, liquid bossa nova. And then I started investigating a little more about who he was and how he connected to that movement. And so I didn't have a title for the book for a long time. And I had some other working titles. I don't even remember what they were now. I think Sugarland was one of them because uh, <laughs> there's such a sugar industry in mm. uh, Florida and for other reasons. But one day I just, I started thinking about the tropics and how much of my book is centered around all aspects of living in Florida, not just the natural environments, but the urban environments as well. So I, I just figured it really worked. It's, I, I think of the book as a mashup of sorts. There's, there's music, there's art, there's the greenery. Mm-hmm. of South Florida, this persistent sort Very of vivid. wilderness. Mm-hmm. But there, it's, there's a lot of city living in there, too. And the movement in Brazil was also a kind of mashup mm-hmm. of different art and socio-political ideas. I just figured it, it worked. It was the mm-hmm. right one. And as soon as I thought it, I just felt that click inside. Mm-hmm. And I knew that we had selected the right type. In spite of uh, the sensuality of, of a lot of the language and, and the lush imagery of, of the topics that you bring um, to the book, it also has a very urban feel, oh. very hard-ed, shadowy figures and expressways and crime. And We get the occasional glimpse of the Art Deco Miami, picture postcard Miami, mm-hmm. but mostly it's the hard edges that you, you focus on in a lot of the book. And from some of the descriptions, it could be New York City, it could be D.C., mm. it could be Detroit, it could even be Rio. Mm. But it's not. It's Miami. And it's very apparent from the outset. I mean, I knew by the third poem that this book was set in Miami. Mm. What is it that you think makes Miami so distinctive and so recognizable? I think it's the convergence of this teagable wildlife. Mm. And not just actual creatures but the flora and the fauna it just, and it just won't be stopped it's so overly developed and so crowded mm-hmm. in in ways i was uh, talking to you how dade county where miami resides is two and a half million people yeah that's even an older sense incredibly condensed mm-hmm. but despite all of that there are abundant waterways the egrets and ibis and hawks and hummingbirds mm. and hibiscus and sable palms and foxes and and they just coexist alongside this grit and i think that is a very miami a very miami thing it's this idea this exotica mm-hmm. you know it's very exotic the kinds of species that dwell there. It's such a fertile place. I like to joke around that you can just fling a tadpole into a puddle of water and there'll be a colony of frogs in a week. But it's a place where life thrives yeah. despite odds. And that's true for the people there as well, I would say. Let's talk about your writing process a little bit. What are triggers for you? How do you begin when you sit down to write a poem? I am completely codependent on my notebook. Mm. I write everything in my notebook first. For the most part, there are some poems that I have written directly on the computer. So you actually draft? Your first drafts are by hand? I don't even think of them as drafts. I just mm. uh, I like to uh, write in my notebook before I go to sleep. At mm-hmm. night. That's mm-hmm. typically when I write, unless I'm traveling and then I write at different times. But I just write down whatever I'm thinking about and then it ignites and goes off into whatever direction but it's very free form and um, sometimes I'm writing in line breaks I'll catch myself doing that and I'll be I, I realize that I've been subconsciously thinking of it as a poem but I just try to anything that's worrying around in my head I try to get that down on the page and then later on I'll go back and I'll start reading my 
notebook, almost like letters to myself, mm. and I will be able to identify this is going to be a poem, that's going to be a poem. Then I'll take it and start typing it in to the computer and start shaping it from there. And that's predominantly how I work. Sometimes it varies, but that's usually it. Do you do many drafts, or do you pretty much kind of shape it as you go along so that by the time you have the first draft, it's almost finished? I think I... Both. I think I'm shaping it as I'm typing it to the computer, and I'm also reworking it as I'm lifting it from the page mm -hmm. onto the screen. And sometimes I finish it, and I think, okay, it's finished for now. Mm -hmm. I have a poem that I was recently working on, not that recently, but a few months ago, about Iowa, a place in Iowa. And I knew it wasn't finished, but I've just been leaving it alone so I could come back to it and, and really make it what it wants to be. Sometimes you re you leave a poem for some weeks or months and you go back to it and you say, oh, you know what, this is finished. Mm -hmm. Has that ever happened to you? Yes, yes, that has That's happened. That's very delightful. Yes, that is <laughs> like, a happy day. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's another, there's, I said two things, but three things about your background that I find fascinating, and that's you're a musician. Mm -hmm. You sing and play bass. Your husband is a musician and you've been in band. Mm -hmm. I would say my husband is the real musician and I'm the dilettante. <laughs> But, but yes, a few years ago, I was writing a story about an indie label in South Florida called Spy Fi Records. And I became friends, uh, as I usually do with my subjects after the story <laughs> is finished, at least the ones I really like. And he's a great guy. His name is Ed Artigas. And he just called me up one day and was like, I think that you, Andrea, and Mindy should be in a band. And Andrea was the art director at the paper, and Mindy huh. was the freelance photographer. I was like... I think Andrea you play should any play instruments the drums. at that point. <laughs> I think you should play the bass, and I think Mindy will play guitar. I'm like, Ed, I, I don't know how to play the bass. And he, he said, so what? <laughs> and I went, okay. <laughs> and so we started meeting at this practice space he had in Hialeah. And I remember the first time I got there, just like going up the stairs, I could literally smell the rats in the roof. It was so disgusting. <laughs> uh, but his space was actually very nice. And he just put the Rickenbacker on me. And he's okay, hit, this is A, this is E, D, A, I don't even remember now. E, A, D, G, E, A, D, G. I'm like, okay. So I just started playing it and singing while I was playing with it. And I started, that's how I started writing songs. I like to sing it more than I like playing the bass. But I didn't want to stand up stage on stage without anything between me and the audience because I was so terrified. So I just insisted on playing a very bad bass guitar. <laughs> but you're a songwriter as well. Yes, I did and a lot of some of the, at least at least one poem in the collection feels to me very much like a song lyric and it's the one country data song in four four time. Was yeah. that was that written as a song? I, yeah, I started writing that the first few lines of that poem many years ago as a song, just mm -hmm. for my own amusement. And, and then one day I decided to finish it and thought it would be funny if I put it in the book. Funny for me, at least. I often think that I worry about being too serious and too sorrowful mm -hmm. and too melancholic in mm -hmm. my work sometimes. Think about the writer into a polka and it's better. Exactly. <laughs> put a beat on it and it cheers things up a little. So I just thought it would be fun to put it in there. And and I, I and now when I, on occasion, uh, I ha I'll read that poem, but I'll sing it. Oh, really? As a song. Yeah. Oh, maybe you'll do that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like you use a different part of your brain when you write songs? Is it, is it a very different process from the writing poem? I think so, very much. I think I actually hear a melody in my head. Mm -hmm. First, you were speaking earlier about your own work and how you hear the music of a poem first. Mm -hmm. So with songs, I hear the music first, and then I write the words to it. And I don't sweat it as much mm -hmm. as I do poetry. It feels a lot looser. I have to pare Black. it down. Pare it, you know. Yeah. It has to be simpler, and mm -hmm. I, I just try to take all the cliches out of it, what I do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Cut them out. But for the most part, it just seems like a much more relaxed process and not as intense I feel that writing poems can be mm -hmm. for me yeah music seems to inform your poetry tremendously I think if I think it's the most salient feature of the book but I feel if there's a soundtrack to all these poems it is not Brazilian jazz it's more like loud searing rock guitar mm -hmm. dissonant and harsh maybe even punk music yeah and it seems to me like the book was organized with this very much in mind 
Um, were you conscious of it as you, as you were writing the poems or even as you were putting the book together or did this just happen? I think that was a direct result of me being very part, uh, very much a part of the local music mm. scene mm. in Miami uh, at one time. Like I mentioned, I was reviewing a, a lot of bands, CDs and shows. and But I also, a lot of those people were my friends. Mm. So I would just go to a lot of shows. That's how I met my husband, mm. to see his band play. And then oh, we you were a groupie. We were friends for many years before we started dating. <laughs> but it was just such a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. Music was such a big part of my life back then. And it still is to some degree, but in a different way. I'm not as involved mm -hmm. in that kind of environment. And we would go to these rock clubs that were very hard and gritty mm -hmm. and edgy, punkish type of thing. Mm -hmm. So it was a great source of inspiration. Why don't you read one of the poems from Tropicalia that, had, that would illustrate that? Um, I was thinking maybe Chicken Lady, or unless you can think of something. We'd... No, I'll, I'll read Chicken Lady. Okay. Sure. Chicken Lady. Gunshots, back alley screens, cats caught in garbage bin, and the rubber-faced man who paced my front sidewalk day and night, his back spooled to a lowercase r, at dawn, I plotted murder when the santera next door sang rum and holy cadence to her nicotine chickens. You pay a price for spackle and spit, for rent, raid, utilities. Then the dropkick fee no one tells you about for living in the guts of your city. It can kick your skull clean. I moved to a land of green, medians and swept gutters, guillotine windows and invisible neighbors. The cats are collared, the garbage doubles as sculpture. I am five minutes from arterial highways, holistic parks, the best and brightest pre-Ks. I'm cornered by oak, ficus, streets named Pleasantberry and sweet lover. I've bought a chick, the puff and peeping kind. We watch for sirens and salesmen, eat pears and pecan pie. At night, stars shine like knives through my eyelids. There are snakes in the trees. I can hear the ticking of their tongues. That's excellent. Very soon. Can I ask you something? I'm just curious. What is it about that poem that reminds you of that loud, crashing rock music? Some of the language. Rock. The dropkick fee, the guillotine windows, the garbage doubles a sculpture. Mm -hmm. That to me, that's just sort of just very urban kind of heart. Mm -hmm. And the three you know, if we were going to read that to music, it wouldn't be a waltz. No. <laughs> It's a subtle thing. There are other poems that are more obvious, like Noise Band Concerto. It's about that. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to go with something that was just more subtle mm -hmm. and just showed you know, the music in, in the way that you read it. Let's talk about another one of your poems. Mm -hmm. How to Write a Poem, Theory Number 62. This is a, it's a directional poem. Follow these instructions and you'll end up with a poem. Now, why Theory Number 62? Is there... 61 other theories that we can look forward to reading about? I think there's innumerable <laughs> theories that you could, you could come up with. And I think this is just my homage to that idea that there is no one way to write a poem. And every time I come to the page, it, in some senses, it feels like the first time. And there's always that sense of anxiety. Have I forgotten how to do this? Mm. Can, you know, can I still put this together? Um, it's, a, it's a different map every time to find your way there uh, there's just no one way to do it so this was that, that title is a little like snarky way of <laughs> me saying there are no answers this isn't an equation but rather a, a sort of journey into a place that you really don't see or even know what it looks like until you start moving towards it this is one of my favorite pieces in the book why don't you read it for us sure how to write a poem, theory number 62. The beginning should eat the eyes. 
It's the part of the movie where you step into line at the bodega with Our Lady of the Sponge Curlers. She's buying toilet paper and Mahatma rice. This is her life, and you happen to ease into it at the wooden lull between explosions. You could also begin while she's watching her husband drop the scot he's sucked for days. Hear glass break magnificent rain over the linoleum. If you are still mouthless, use seraphim and penumbra. Both will drape the frame in velvet, pearl the hems with high art, and smart girl words that hide, God, please, God, don't let me flinch, fail, fall into the dark. A mention of babel or blackberries wouldn't hurt either. The question of where to snap the line at its finest edge can freeze the brain with dread. The blade must be sharp enough to have the moon and the dark clutter of sky. Ignore this for the moment. There is nothing left except the flutter of wings beneath the stabbing. A woman before the stove stirring rice and wishing death. The river outside her window, how it glosses after rain, not like mirrors or a polished lens, simply water falling dark. I think those commas make the poem, that pausing between the words. Mm -hmm. But this is a great piece. The beginning should eat the eyes. That's one of those seminal lines, the kind of lines that, you know, people will remember 20 years from now. Oh, that wrote that line. Right. I, think. I hadn't thought of it that way, but it's nice to hear. <laughs> well, the, thing, the thing about it is it, it's almost shock value. And it, it builds, a, it presents a tremendous tension right at the outset, and the reader doesn't know whether to laugh or to be horrified. And, and then, then there's humor. I love the combination of the humor and the pathos in the poem. Our Lady of the Sponge Curler. Mm -hmm. so we've all stood behind her at the bodega yes. at some point or another. <laughs> well, it was great to hear, you, to hear you read the poem. So there's nothing I love more than to hear a poet read their own work. Me too. Me too. What are you working on now? What is next? Uh, what is next? I'm, I've written, finished one poem for the next book. And so I have page one. Page one, <laughs> yes. Uh, many more to go. But And then I have, as I mentioned, assorted drafts of something in my notebooks and in my computer that I really need to sit down and hammer out. And I'm thinking about just working part-time this summer mm -hmm. or even less so I can really focus on doing that because I'm freelancing, I'm adjuncting, I do I work at a writing center mm -hmm. at another university. It's just a lot of help. A lot of hats. And like you, I have my family and my friends and my home. And those, that, that part of, those parts of my life are very important to me, mm -hmm. as, yeah. as important as, as poetry. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to neglect them. So sometimes I think you have to, I've had to give up some of the more creature comforts that come along with a regular job mm -hmm. in order to really be productive. Mm -hmm. Any plans to write a book of prose with your journalism background? Yeah, I think it's logical. Very much. I've written a couple of essays, a few essays over the years here and there. Mm -hmm. And one was actually published in Gulfstream and then was picked up by the best of the net. And I think of that as a beginning of that collection. But that is very much something I want to do. And maybe I'll wind up finishing that before the next book of poems. I don't know yet mm -hmm. what's going to happen. I read this great quote by Dr. O. E.L. Dr. O. And he says that writing a novel, but I say, I think this is true of all writing, is like driving a car on the highway at night. You can only see as far as your headlights go, but that's enough to take you the whole way there. Huh. And I always think about that. Unless, when of I course, feel. the lights go out. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I don't want. I don't want to think about that part. But I always think about that when I feel frustrated or anxious that I'm not moving along mm. as far, or I don't know what's coming yeah. up, or what shape is this going to take. And I always just remind myself: this one 
inch at a time, as uh, a friend told me once. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to ride the wave and see where it takes you. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Who are you reading now? I just, I just, re- I'm rereading your book, The Secret History of Water. <laughs> I read yours too. And I just finished Slow Lightning by Eduardo Corral, which is mean, great. He was, he's one of those writers that you were talking about how you read outside your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that experience of reading his work. It's surreal. It's got little touches of narrative, but it's just very imaginative, mm-hmm. majestic. And then in the wings, I have Waiting Larry Levis, mm. Winter Stars, yes. which I already sneaked a peek at the first poem of that. Right. And, and I'm also reading a book of essays edited, co-edited in part by Blas uh, Falconer, mm. called uh, The Other Latino. It's all about uh, personal essays about from different Latino writers all over the country, you know, how they perceive themselves and what part, if any, their culture uh, takes in their creative work. And in their personal lives, it's very interesting. I actually plan on uh, interviewing him soon. Oh, uh, And, and write, possibly writing a little post for a blog. In closing, I would like to hear one more of your poems, if that's okay. I wanted to, because we've been talking about the hard edges, and the, really, the book is actually very balanced. There are some beautiful love poems, there's some nature poems, and there are poems that show a kind of gentle Miami as well. And so I'd like for you to read one of these, which is actually one of the loveliest poems in the book, in an alcove between the beacon and the Avalon. And mentioned, I'm really glad you asked me to read this poem. I, ha- I never read it. It's one of the oldest poems in the book. Hmm. And I just feel like I have not been giving it enough attention and love. Oh, <laughs> so it's good. nice that, uh, <laughs> that you've asked me, and I'm, and I'm glad that you've, that you've enjoyed it. Um, it, it was inspired in part by a walk I took on Ocean Drive mm. uh, one summer evening and the beautiful pastel hotels that line the ocean yeah. there. And these are two of them. In an alcove between the Beacon and the Avalon. Hotels, sure, but also pastel monoliths to fortune and revival, to traveler's palm, to citronella, to mambo and techno. Praise bay leaves, star jasmine, alleyways seeded with saffron and ordered refuse. Praise the diamond-clad ships cruising the horizon, fluid and preordained, and the sky chalked cobalt and plum, everything rose-soaked until the very air is water-colored solace. So what if we're rum drunk, if we dined on too much chocolate and salt and the good meat of grouper? These are the godly nights, the longing exact for what is loved, a friend's voice, the familiar hands at the elbow, and the wind plucked skin with autumn, showing how beauty is better felt than seen. How gratitude is another word for joy. Very lovely. Thank you so much. It's been great. And good luck to you and your next book.